What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to start off with a presentation. Actually, it's an article from Wall Street Journal that talks about the spectrum of nation states' capability. Wall Street Journal basically has you know, three categories of nation state capabilities. So if you start from the left to right, and if your country is on the left, it's basically you know, nothing much. You're, you're an aspiring country. You don't have any formalized unit. You rely on you know, third-party uh, tools. If you are developing, you have some capabilities. You're going to have some formalized unit. Uh, you know, in-house tools, you may rely on private teams. But the most sophisticated countries would be the one on the right-hand side here that you see. Mature countries, formalized military and intelligence unit, uh, tight integration of computer network operation with national goals, right? Of cyber operations that are closely integrated with kinetic military operations. And you can see that for yourself. What Wall Street Journal also did was uh, they put different countries uh, into these different categories. Yeah, right here. So you can see that uh, you know, there are different countries that are on aspiring, developing, and mature. And uh, as you're going through this list, uh, you, know, you may not agree with some of the options that they put in here. So for example, I was actually uh, in South Korea uh, recently, and uh, the, the team from South Korea said, well, you know, you put us, Wall Street Journal put us in uh, mature. Really, I think we're in developing. The North Koreans are you know, really at the, the mature countries right there. Right? Now, as you look, th look through the list, I'm going to give you two observations. The first observation is that over time, uh, countries will move from left to right. Left to right. In international relation, there is a concept called security dilemma. The idea that, you know, if you see other countries moving from left to right, you are also being compelled to move from left to right. In 2014, uh, NATO, uh, in, actually, sorry, in 2016, in the Warsaw Summit, uh, NATO basically announced that uh, cyber is a domain of operation, just as air, land, sea, and space, okay? And so that's the first observation. The second observation is really about, you know, if everyone is moving from left to right, isn't it fair to ask the question of, you know, what tools, what treaties, or what laws do we have to govern the behavior in cyberspace, okay? In 2014, NATO basically uh, announced that international law on armed conflict apply to cyber operation. Now, you think about international law on, on armed conflict. Uh, the last convention, that was the, the fourth Geneva Convention, was done in 1949. I assure you, in 1949, there is no such thing as cyber operation or cyber defense or cyber security in the Geneva Convention. How then do you apply international law on armed conflict to cyber operation? Now, this is where, you know, the Tallinn Manual comes into place. This is basically a manual that was put together by international legal experts that basically looked at how international law, reinterpreting international law and apply that to cyber warfare. How many of you have gone through, heard of the Italian manual? Raise your hand. Okay, one guy, two guys. How many of you have read it? <laughs> no? Okay. How many of you cannot sleep at night? <laughs> this is a great, great book to read if you cannot sleep at night. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you have read the book, uh, you basically find that there are two, uh, it basically covers two distinct body of law. The first part is called use ad bellum. That use ad bellum basically talks about the criteria uh, nation states will have to consult before they go to war. Uh, should I use diplomacy? Do I really need to use force here? Right? So you have to go through a whole set of criteria before you, know, you start to go to war. And after you decided to go to war, the next body of law kicks in, and that's the use in battle part of that. And that's basically asking the question of, who can you shoot and what can you shoot, right? So use that bellum and use in bellow. Now, to be fair, um, this Tallinn manual came out in 2013. Uh, but to be fair, uh, the interest about how you interpret international law to cyber warfare started many, many years ago. In fact, before 9-11. It's just that when we had 9-11, uh, the international legal expert community were focusing on the war on terror and it wasn't until the event in 2007 in 
2008 in Georgia, uh, that you know, they all put their heads together and say, we really need to put this uh, together, right? Now, this is 2013. Uh, the Tallinn Manual uh, last year, exactly 12 months ago, came out with uh, Tallinn 2. Uh, so if you look at the, this chart here, it says cyber warfare, Tallinn 2 has got a much broader operation, right? cyber operation coverage, right? So this is more peacetime and borderline operation as well. So it has that element as well. And the book is thicker, so if you cannot sleep, that's an even better book to read um, as well. Now, I say that this is actually quite relevant for our time because when you see what's happening today, uh, a lot of cyber activities are really around peacetime and borderline operation. For example, the US elections hacking, right? So this is a case where, you know, Russian threat groups, APT28, APT29, um, allegedly hack into DNC, Democratic National Committee, and, you know, in an effort to steer the U.S. election in Donald Trump's favor. Now, just to, you know, pull it up front here, that is, this idea of influencing election is not new. In fact, I read some report, uh, an analysis of how many of these influencing election has been done in the past by the United States and Russia and, of course, the Soviet Union. So, turns out that, you know, since World War II, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union, Russia, you know, have tried 146 times to influence elections around the globe. So it's not new, okay? So in fact, if you look at, uh, you know, right after World War II, uh, we have what we call the Marshall Plan. This is where the United States say, okay, we need to rebuild Europe. We put up this Marshall Plan. Stalin on the east side basically were very insecure about what the U.S. were doing. So Stalin basically created CCB or Communist Communication Bureau. And basically, you know, those days, you know, they put up, um, you know, this sort of a propaganda campaign. If you read German, you see that on the left-hand side, it says, you know, who is really helping who? You know, the U.S. may seem to be altruistic. They want to help. But really, they are the ones getting all, a lot of the profit right there. The second one, uh, this poster here. Uh, if you read German, you see that, you know, this is a uh, heads movement means jack of hearts, which is a, a definition for someone who is, um, you know, altruistic, right? So the, basically accusing the U.S. of saying, you know, they're, they're being, you know, they're, they're not really real, okay? And so don't vote for the party that's supporting the U.S., but instead vote for the Communist Party. So this is not new. Now, what is new today, though, when it comes to elections and, you know, influence operation is that, you know, with cyber hacking, with the advent of social media like Facebook, like Twitter and YouTube, you know, you can actually do influence operation at scale and not only at scale, uh, you know, with precision as well, right? with a lot of sophistication. And that's what is new here. So on our part, um, if you have been following FireEye, uh, we've come up some paper uh, analysis around, you know, the APT28 group. How many of you have seen it? This, uh, you have seen it? Yeah. So this was, uh, these are two of uh, the most important ones. I have some input onto the first one on the left here. So basically, we try to give you some insights into how APT28 have evolved, uh, the threat group have evolved its, um, you know, operation over time. This is a threat group that we have been tracking for, you know, 12 years, 12, 13 years, at least 12, 13 years. Now, as I say at the beginning, I meet a lot of uh, country leaders. And, you know, when the U.S. elections happen, one of the things that they are always concerned about is that, you know, what if this happens to my country? What if my elections are being influenced by third-party countries, right? What do you do then? So, you know, Countries are trying to make sense. Country leadership are trying to make sense about, you know, how do you interpret this event here, right? And sometimes, you know, as you look at the different comments that come out, uh, some comments that or some views are oversimplified. Some views are, you know, exaggerated as well. The oversimplified view sounds something like this, okay? There's, they basically say, well, you know, cyber espionage or espionage is not illegal. Every country spies on every other country, right? 
So yes, it may be true that Russia spy on America, but are you saying that America or the you know the British and the German they never stole anything from the Russian? And how could this be illegal? Okay, that's one way of saying that. Okay, and that is also to say that well, spying espionage is the second oldest profession in the world. You know, we cannot. You know, this is not illegal. You, uh, you all know what the oldest profession in the world is, right? So, okay. Right. Now, the other extreme is basically is about, oh, this is an act of war. And so, what does that mean? We all now, you know, start going to war with Russia because they interfere with the election. Obviously not, right? So, what I've done is basically I spent six months researching the subject. I had time to talk to different country leaders. In fact, the last one was actually done in South Korea, the National Security Institute. And basically, I tried to condense our discussion into this particular white paper that I call legal and geopolitical perspective. That is to say, you know, if you think about this particular cyber event, how does that initially connect to what we now know as national sovereignty? And from there, we can now deduce, okay, is this really an accepted case of state espionage? Or is it an internationally wrongful act? The other thing that the, the paper actually examined is this thing called, you know, actions of non-state actors to state actors. How do you attribute that? APT28 and APT29 are non-state actors, but then you see a lot of news commentary saying, oh, it's Putin that's responsible, okay? But that's state actor. The non-state actors are APT28, 29. What is then the threshold for you need for, for you to establish before you can say, hey, it is the state that is now responsible. And finally, you know, if you are affected by this, then what could be then a proportional response? How do you respond? Do you go to war? What other measures do you have right, as a country going forward? So this is, you know, uh, I think, you know, this is what's new. And that is, you know, when it comes to cybersecurity, you know, I think a lot of the focus have always been from a country perspective, very focused around, let's try to do more technically, right, to tackle the threat. But I think over time, we need to think about strategically, how do we handle uh, something like this? Now, enough about Russia. What about China? Um, you know, most European countries uh, are very concerned about Russia, and understandably so, because Russia is just right next door, okay? And China is a country that's so far away. How could they be, you know, a problem? In fact, I met one of the director of national intelligence in one of these uh, European countries. And when he first saw me, he basically said, my number one threat is Russia. Number two is Russia. My number three is also Russia. Okay. So I say, well, hold on. I think Russia may be important now, but I think going forward, uh, you're going to see China playing a much, much more important role. And I'll give you some reasons for that uh, in this presentation. In 2016, uh, the Chinese government put together a strategy that says, here are the nine industries that we absolutely have to win and dominate in the next 20 years. So when it comes to the Chinese and how, you know how they do their planning, you know, it's not two years ahead, it's not three years ahead. They're looking at 20 years, 30 years and beyond. And they said, we absolutely have to win across all this, right? And so if you, uh, like us, you know, you're tracking a lot of these uh, Chinese groups, you find that they're targeting today, okay? All the Chinese threat groups today are basically aligned with what the government central planning goals are around these nine areas. So for example, if you're in biotech, you know, I think you should really understand which Chinese groups are basically looking at biotech and try to steal your intellectual property. And you need to design your countermeasure uh, accordingly. Very, very key uh, right here. Now, the other thing that's interesting about China is that um, prior to 2013, um, in its 5,000 years of history, uh, the Chinese has only tried two times in its 5,000 year history to project power going west. Okay? The first time was actually second century BC. And most of you may have heard of the Silk Road that you know, basically opens up the trade route from China to Central Asia and then finally end up in Europe. 
That was the first time. The second time that the Chinese tried to project power going west was during the 15th century. You may have heard of the, the maritime expedition, right? The, the, the Admiral Zheng He He basically has an armada of ships, you know, going west. In fact, one of the British sailors basically had a book out that says, um, you know, Christopher Columbus did not discover America. The Chinese discovered America first before Christopher Columbus did. And so that was the, you know, the height of this power projection. And after the Ming Dynasty collapsed, okay, at the end of the 15th century, this whole thing went away. Now, in 2013, the current Chinese president, Xi Jinping, he basically said, hey, this Silk Road and this Maritime route, why don't we combine them together? Let's do the same thing, but let's do the two things now. And with that, you know, you have this project called the One Belt, One Road project. How many of you have heard of that? Okay. Perfect. All right. And so it's a little bit confusing as you look through this here. The maritime route that you see here that comes from China, okay, all the way to Europe, that's the road. Okay, and then the land, the silk road is the belt, okay? And so this is the starting point. And I took it from the, uh, the Chinese uh, website, uh, the Chinese government website here. This encompasses some 65 countries, about 30% of the world GDP. What the Chinese want to do is, of course, you know, you know, build the infrastructure that connects China with the rest of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East uh, as well, right? Going through Russia. So today, you will see that you can find a train that travels from Shanghai to the UK in 60 days. A little bit faster than you know, what a ship or container will, will take, slower than an airplane, uh, but you, know, you see that this infrastructure is already in place. Now, you may ask the question of, so what's that got to do with cyber? This is all about you know, economic development, infrastructure, build up. You know. so, if you look at it from a Chinese point of view, they're going to look at this and say there are 65 countries we need to negotiate port access, okay? telecommunication structure, highways, bridges, and everything here. Okay? They, and there are 65 of these different countries to, to work with and also to negotiate with. Where are they, if you have a cyber capability, where will you be tasking your cyber team? Well, all these things here, right? Executive emails, business process, negotiation plan. They want to know what is your negotiating position before they start negotiating with you, right? And everything that you see here, you know, they don't make headlines at all, okay? You know, they are not, you know, these are simple stuff. I just need to know what your negotiating position because I need to have this power projection project uh, going forward. Interesting enough, if you look at the... Uh, the amount of money spent by the Chinese in 2016 is about $500 billion. Now, in comparison, the United States of America spent about $650 billion a year on the military budget. So you can ask yourself a question. Do you want to spend $650 billion a year on the military power projection using military force? Or do you want to spend $500 billion a year for economic power projection? Which one gives you more bang for the buck? Okay. That's something to think about. Do right? you want to spend like what the US is spending or do you want to spend here? Okay. So yeah, it's a difficult world. I, I acknowledge that. And one thing I would say is that you know, hopefully by now, I've not talked about Iran and Korea and you know, all these the other countries yet. But what I will tell you is that you know, going forward, uh, attacks will continue to reflect geopolitical conditions. Absolutely. Okay. All these things are going to drive a lot of the you know, attacks in cyberspace here. Now, uh, where do we stand then when it comes to cyber defense? Uh, we have in FireEye a business division called Mandian, and what they specialize in doing is basically incident response on all these different bridges that matter. In fact, last year, uh, they spent a million hours uh, responding to bridges. And they basically came up with this sort of a statistics, right? So if you look at the slide here, um, the average time before a bridge is discovered is 99 days. That's also known as the dwell time, right? That's the time when 
the breach has started to the time that it's being detected. You know, so that's 99 days. It's way too long. It has come down from 200 plus days to an average of 99 days, but it's way too long because you know, if the red team can get in to your network and gain an administrator privilege within two days, that's 97 days uh, too long. And then on the average, it takes 32 days to respond to a bridge. Average cost of a bridge you know, is $4 million. What's also interesting in our investigation, okay, that's 1 million hours of front row seat, is that most of these clients, 85% of them, uh, they are clients with existing MSSP. So, and also they all have the SIM as well. So, you know, this is, you know, having MSSP and the ability to use the SIM doesn't quite, you know, prevent you from, you know, getting breached. So, you know, that's an interesting observation. Now, one study from IBM in 2017 uh, basically put out, a, a, you know, a figure that says, um, in any given year, there's 28% chances that your company will be breached. 28% chance. So that means in every given year, one out of four organizations in this room here will be breached. Okay, or if I do my math correct, that everyone will be breached in this room every four years. Okay? So that's a, a staggering number. I don't know if I believe that, and if that's true, and maybe it's true, um, then what you may get the impression is that you know, breaches are inevitable. It's going to happen. Inevitable. It's going to happen. What I'd like to say, though, is that although breaches are inevitable, uh, the consequences of a breach are not inevitable. Inevitable, right? You can have a way to control your destiny. Now, just because a bad guy, you know, bypass your prevention measure and get into your network, doesn't mean that it's actually a bad thing. Because you know, if you have good response and detection capability. And what you do then is then you are able to detect that quickly and chase down the problem. Then your impact is going to be very, very minimized. Okay? On the other hand, if you, don't have, you know, if you don't have a good response and detection capability, well, as you increase the dwell time, the impact is going to go larger and larger. Right? That makes sense. Hopefully, this makes sense. Right? So the key thing here is detect that quickly and chase it down and you can minimize the impact. Uh, internally, within FireEye, our CEO, uh, Kevin Mandia, has set a target of 10 minutes. 10 minutes from the first intrusion to the time you detect that, and then resolve that. 10 minutes is our goal. Okay? Not 99 days. Okay? That's not going to get you anywhere. So it turns out that you know, this whole idea, this whole idea of breaches may be inevitable, but consequences are not. Okay? makes sense not only for individual organization, but it's also making sense for the country as a whole. Right? So let me explain why that's the case. So most of the time when we think about impact right, of a bridge, we think about that in terms of cost, how much does it cost you? In fact, my previous slide basically said $4 million per, you know, per bridge. But from a national security point of view, okay, this impact it's not just about cost, it's also about the survival of the nation, right? So if you think about bad guys, you know, trying to undermine your, your country, uh, all they have to do is to attack your critical infrastructure. There are many, many sectors here, transportation, finance, you know, electricity, you know, you can name it, right? So, and once one of these in infrastructure is being compromised, you will have a cascading impact throughout the whole economy. So what would that turn out to be? Well, people may die. Okay? People will get injured. There might be destructions to property. And some of you may not realize this, uh, that you know, if you cannot control the impact of this happening, you may force the hands of your country leaders to go to war uh, as well. Right? So for example, uh, if there are two countries here, this country, good country, right? What, what should we call a country? Acacia? How about that? Nice flower, okay? Everyone here is, you know, nice, peaceful, innovative, and all that. On this side, where my colleagues are sitting, and they are the, you know, the bad country. We call them demonia, okay? Demonia. And what they will do is they say, huh, 
or five minutes left. What they will do is say, hey, we don't really like these people on this side here. What we'll do is we'll launch an attack on the critical infrastructure, destroy you know, properties, people will die and all that. So the question becomes, you know, when do you go to war then with these guys? At what point do you go to war? Well, how you go to war is, you know, there are a number of reasons why you go to war, okay? Uh, one is, one thing that binds all the countries together is this thing called international law. That is, you know, there are rules by which you evaluate when do you go to war. If I can plot this graph here called the conflict intensity, there are actually two thresholds that different countries will have to look at. When do I go to war? The first one is called the arm attack and use of force. Arm attack basically represents the most severe form of use of force, right? And so, how do you know if something has reached the threshold of use of force to an arm attack? Well, you have this criteria, as I mentioned to you, injury or death to individual or destruction to property, right? Now, according to the rule, uh, okay, the UN rule is that, you know, states are prohibited to use force against another state, for sure, okay? And when do you go to war? Well, when you suffer from an arm attack. And that means, you know, if you cannot control the impact of an attack and it rises up to that level of arm attack, your leaders have no choice but actually go to war, unfortunately, okay? Now, very quickly, I will say this, okay? It's no more the case where, you know, you can get a equipment and say, you know, put it in your network and hopefully things will work out. Why? Because uh, the adversaries are evolving very quickly. So, you know, you need to have an adaptive uh, defense. And from our perspective, uh, intelligence-led security is really what is key here. That is, you need to be able to understand how your adversaries are evolving and then you adapt to it. What I'm going to do very quickly, and this is the, the last slide here, is that you know, there are a number of uh, discussions around what exactly is cyber intelligence. Okay? Depending on who you ask, they will say different things to you. But at least let me, um, in the last couple of minutes here, explain to you what we understand when it comes to cyber intelligence. If I were to give you a whole bunch of threat indicators, and that could be IP address, or file hashes, and URL, is that intelligence to you? What do you think? Front row. The top students are always in the front row. <laughs> do you think that's intelligence? Is that enough to be intelligence? Probably not, right? Because, you know, what's behind an IP address? Well, there's no context to this IP address, you know, it may generate a lot of alerts and, and things like that, okay? Now, your visibility of the threat actually gets better if you have a way to characterize the behavior of malware, right? So this is usually in the form of a data feed that comes to you. Uh, but this sort of characterization in itself, while well, it is important because it gives you new access to the tools and the net and, and host artifacts, uh, this malware analysis is also backward-looking. Things have, have already happened, and you're now looking at, okay, what happened? How did this take place? Okay? And suddenly, machines that are analyzing this, they do not read minds. You know, who was behind this, and what were they intending to do as they come into the network? And that is why, you know, to complete the entire picture, threat intelligence will have to include things like motivation, tools, and tactics, and procedure, right? It's very adversary-focused, and it gives you context as to, you know, what these adversaries are doing, okay? What's behind the particular indicators? And the last point I'd like to make in this particular slide is that uh, as you look at everything on the right-hand side here, okay, uh, everything at the bottom half, that's really, really easy to change. Things like hash value, IP addresses, and domain names. What does it take to change a hash value of a malware? Very easy, you just recompile it, and that's it. You have a different hash value because it takes into account a different time. So these things are really, really easy to change. The top part here, those are really hard to change for the bad guys. So if you're in the business of keeping track of the bottom half, good luck in your cyber defense. But I, you know, if you are in the business of trying to keep track of what's happening up there on the upper half, then I think you have a fighting chance, okay? So with that, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your attention. Hopefully this is uh, interesting and informative for everyone. Thank you very much.